All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're glad to have you here. Um, so at yet another community check-in. So we have a couple items that we have. We don't have many questions today that we'll email in. Uh, so we have four big topics we'll be talking about today. Um, after the four big topics, I'll answer the question that was sent in. Um, and then obviously um, afterwards, uh, we'll open it up for any questions that we have. Um, as we normally do, um, please understand that, you know, we're, we're going to, it's, it's how many questions we can get within the, the time frame. Uh, just as uh, uh, what we normally do, uh, if you are looking for Spanish translation, there is a little globe at the bottom uh, that you can click uh, and you can hear this in Spanish. And I've been told to, I'm going to try to remember to slow down just a little bit so that uh, Lucila can keep up with me. Um, and I'll say it one more time. Hi, traducion al español de Spon y Po. Haga click in el globo en la esquina interior derecha. Um, so again, for those of you who would like to hear this in Spanish at the exact same time, there's a little globe. I know I keep doing this um, as if that's going to tell you exactly where it is, but it is on the bottom right-hand corner. Um, and then again, hi, traducion al español de Spon y Po. I got click in El Globo in La Esquina Interior Derecha. All right, with that said, um, the first thing is I want to talk a little bit about the COVID checklist. Um, so we have spent a lot of time uh, working on making sure that we have a safe uh, environment. Uh, starting last week, every school uh, started publishing a checklist um, to sort of give you an update about where they are to making sure that the, the uh, school is safe. Um, we publish one as a district also um, that sort of tells you here are the items that we're working on as a group. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to say that we have only as a district, we only have a couple more and, and each site is making progress also. A lot of it has to deal with education and making sure that we have the right approach to teaching kids about how to clean their masks, PPE, um, and how to stay safe when they get on campus. Um, so we, uh, we published these on Friday. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Westover to talk about one of the big ones that we still have uh, that as we move closer to reopening, that we're going to be reaching out to parents to talk about. And this one deals with uh, the entry points that we're going to have and the possibility that we may need to have staggered openings. Uh, so Dr. Westover, I'll let you uh, take it from there. Sure. So over the summer, we had multiple um, focus group meetings and then through Thought Exchange, heard back from parents and teachers in the community about what types of things needed to be in place for parents to feel safe and for teachers, to, teachers and staff to feel safe to come back to campus. Um, one of the things that was consistently brought up in all of the focus groups and through the thought exchange was having um, control who, over who is on and off, on the campus during school hours. And right now, all of our campuses are very open. So one thing that we've started to work on um, over the summer and now is making sure we have perimeter controls around, around our campuses. So this would be extending existing fence lines that are already there, sometimes just putting a gate in because a lot of our campuses have um, uh, perimeter controls, but just don't have a gate. So it's adding a gate in some places to make sure that when school starts, that we're able to control who's on campus. And then if hopefully someday kids will be out on the field playing for PE and we don't have to worry about um, an adult coming onto campus um, who hasn't been screened. So the purpose is really to make sure the kids are safe during the day. But at all of their times, the, the campuses would be open. So after school is out, all of the gates would be unlocked so the, the community could use the, the fields and the playgrounds. Um, the principals were part of the process of determining where what would be a good position for the perimeter controls and gave feedback. We had several rounds of feedback over the summer of the position of uh, the perimeter controls. So, uh, unfortunately, for a school district, we're not able to go out and hire someone to put in a fence. 
we have to go through a long process to make sure it's safe, which in the long run, it is a very good thing because the last thing we want is, is a gate to fall on a child. So we have architects and engineers that work with us to make sure everything is safe. Um, and we're in the process of um, getting that through a DSA or the Div Division of State Architect. Um, and over the next few weeks, you'll be hearing from principals about kind of what this looks like if you have any questions. But again, the, the ultimate purpose was to make sure that um, staff and students um, were safe during the day and we were able to control to make sure we didn't have um, unscreened people on campus. Because um, it was very it was very clear from the, the staff that this was important to them. Now, one of the important uh, pieces of this is that we also want to make sure um, if you look on our checklist, it talks about the entry points for families um, and how how are we going to protect families as they're walking onto campuses. Um, and then so we we are probably going to have to designate different areas to control the amount of people who are coming on. And we may also uh, need to stagger some of the times. I know we at the middle schools, we've already put the kids through sort of a stagger time so that they, they get used to it. But at the elementary schools, depending on how many students want to come in, uh, we will probably also have to stagger the times also. Um, and that is really um, as part of the CDC, uh, CD, CDE and uh, California Department of Public Health and Santa Clara Department of Public Health guidelines that they have. Uh, but because we have a, a sort of a runway before this process actually starts, uh, we want to make sure that people were informed. But we also have other construction projects that are going to be taking place. And so Dr. Westover is going to be meeting with every principal, and then every principal is going to be talking about what those projects actually entail. Um, so with that, I want to go ahead and jump into actual reopening. I know this is a lot of questions this is where a lot of people uh, sort of want to know, so what are we doing? Um, so we talked yesterday extensively with the board, or last night, um, about sort of what we are doing to get to the reopening process. As, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the county, or not the county, the state, sort of changed their process. So uh, originally they had what was called the monitoring list and 98% of the state was on the monitoring list. I think Death Valley uh, what, wasn't on the monitoring list and there was like some other place in remote Cal California. And so pretty much no one was ever gonna get off the list. Um, and I think what the state decided to do was to sort of change that and to sort of make it similar to what we see for cities and counties for reopening, that's more of a tiered phase. And so they've now went from one monitoring list to what is called a tiered monitoring list. So this week, um, we are currently in purple. And purple is the most restrictive uh, approach. Purple says that you have widespread um, transmission of COVID um, and then it, each level goes. So it's like purple, then there's red, then there's orange, and I think the last one is yellow. I don't think there's ever a green uh, in this case. And so we actually are purple right now. Uh, but if you look at the uh, where we are trending um, and they have an adjusted rate, so there are two numbers and I, I I thank Trustee Conley for explaining the, the second one um, last night, but there are two numbers that they're looking at. There's the first number, which is 8.7, and the last number, which is, um, I think it's 6.7. And so that's based off of the number of tests that a county is given. Um, so for us and in Santa Clara County, we are actually trending towards red, and we won't know uh, until this weekend uh, what's gonna happen. So uh, what I would say is if we want to get to reopen and we want to get out, is like everybody wear their masks this weekend. Uh, I know we want to go to the beaches and we want to, we want to enjoy everything, but you know, if you go to the beach or if you're out, please wear your mask and stay six feet away from everybody. Uh, so that way we can get closer to it. If not, then you know, if we see a spike, um, it's, it's, it's definitely going to impact us. But as we're doing that, we're going ahead and starting to plan for reopening. And one of the things that we've learned, um, and I think you know, uh, one of the things that's evident is that when you, when you give an organization time to sort of plan, uh, the plan tends to be a little bit better than when you get three days uh, to try and create a Band-Aid for it, right? And so I'm not arguing that uh, for everyone, 
distance learning is perfect. I'm not trying to say I think it's the best of what we can do considering the circumstances that we have, right? But what I will say uh, is that it is better than, and I know there are some people who like the, the more asynchronous format, but it is better for more of our kids uh, this way than what it was in the springtime. And I think that's in large part to the amount of planning that's taking place. The fact that our teachers um, have devices, uh, the fact that all of our kids have devices, the fact that we now have all but three sites that have Wi-Fi enabled parking lots, the, you know, the, the fact that um, we, we've sort of tackled, we've came up with a plan to provide internet um, on a wider scale, prioritizing who gets hotspots, versus prioritizing how we can support uh, families with the essentials program. The fact that we are able to give our teachers more training, like all of that is in due in large part to planning. And so what we wanna do is start the planning process for reopening uh, to getting to stage three. Now, I'll be honest, I don't know when stage three is gonna come, uh, but what I do wanna do is I wanna go ahead and plan. And so that has several implications, right? So we're gonna send out a registration survey again, uh, and we're gonna ask you to make a choice between B and between C. Now, I, and I know that, you know, there's, there's concern about losing your child's teacher. There's concern about uh, what the hybrid model looks like compared to what you're currently getting. Um, and so over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be meeting to talk about what we believe is really feasible, right? And so this, and, and I will say, this is not a perfect approach. Perfect would be we just ignore what everybody is trying to do, right? If we said you either in connected or when we go to hybrid, everybody goes to hybrid, whether you choose that or not, that's the easiest way for us to plan. Right now, we're trying to, to, to make as many people comfortable and happy as possible, which means that we have multiple plans going at the exact same time. Uh, but that means it comes at a cost, right? It comes at a cost of trying to find enough teachers for C, which is our connected approach, and enough teachers for B, uh, which is the in-person. So what does that mean? It means over the next couple of weeks as we design the survey, the registration uh, uh, form, uh, we want to make sure that we're clear about what this is gonna look like as best as we can. But if you are a person who knows that you need your child to go in for some type of reason, whether it's for your job or whether it's for your own sanity, and even if it was only for two days or if it was for four days, if you know that you're in that camp, I ask for you to choose B. And remember, we're gonna do everything in our, in our power to make sure that it's safe. If you know, and there are some of us on here who are saying, no matter what, I am not going to send my kid into school. I do not believe it's safe and I am waiting for a vaccine or I'm waiting for us to get past this pandemic or maybe you're waiting for a change of leadership um, on the federal level. Like whatever the reason is that, is that is holding you back, if you know no matter what, you're gonna choose C. Go ahead and choose C. Now, what that allows us to do is it allows us to plan. Behind the scenes, all of our principals are gonna be working on uh, scheduling kids, and we're gonna do our best to make sure that we schedule kids at their current sites. But it's not a perfect process, and then we don't know if we have enough, enough students across, uh, across the school or across the district to make it happen. But we need to go through this exercise so we know exactly where we stand, uh, so that we know what we can and cannot offer. And if we can keep your kid with their current teacher, we'll try our best to do that. Like that's, that's, the, that's the goal. But you should plan for the worst case scenario, which is it's possible your child may have to switch teachers. Now, we're not gonna, we're not gonna ask for any child to change teachers until we get into that two week period, which means we have announced that we are gonna open. Uh, and then two weeks before that actually starts, that's when, that, that's when we'll have to make the, uh, the choice. That's when the, the information about who your child's new teacher is, if they have a change will occur. Now, I, you know, I, I talked with the board about this last night. 
the day before or the a couple of days before because Eli um, actually goes to school in Virginia with his mom until he moves out here next year. And so Eli, I called his school the week before and I talked to him. His mom was adamant that he was going to go into virtual learning. And he was sort of fine with going into virtual learning until he told me I can do all my homework all day in two hours and then I can play video games for the rest of the day. And that sort of cued me into, I don't know if virtual learning is really the right thing for Eli at this point. Um, so I called the school and I talked to him about what are you doing to keep my child safe? What, is, what are all the, the processes that are in place? And as we went through, I felt really comfortable about making a change. So I moved him into uh, in-person classes and his mom was perfectly fine with that and he loves it right he enjoys the social interaction and if you feel like your child needs that social interaction then I think you should choose B right and there's nothing wrong with that if you feel like your child is at risk or you may be at risk then maybe the hybrid model isn't for you now I say this to say that even though you're choosing right now B or C we're going to give you one more chance right before in that two week window as a confirmation that you have the opportunity. Are you sure? Because we will, by then, we will present it more information and we'll know more about uh, the virus. Are you sure that this is the process you want? And we're going to try our best, similar to what uh, Eli's school did, to honor that request. They were very flexible in allowing us to move the day before. And that worked. And it worked out because actually he was the only kid in his class that was actually going to be in a virtual setting. And so he enjoys it. But every time I talked to him yesterday, he said, I'm not playing football with any of the kids because I'm afraid of catching COVID. And I, and I, I just don't want to. Right. And so that's a that's a good thing. So we're going to give you the opportunity one last time within that two week period to sort of confirm where you want to be. Now, I can't guarantee that we can move you over. Right, because part of the reason why we're going to do this exercise is because we need to we need to start placing kids and put them in sort of a position where we know how many how many teach students are assigned to a particular kid. But if we can move and accommodate a request, whether you decide at the last minute, like I did, that you want to move to B, or whether you, at the last minute you decide you want to move back to C, if we can do it, we will try to accommodate it. But you need to know that at that point it is most likely going to be some teacher from across the district. And I will say just in general, um, and I probably should have opened up with this, our teachers who are really tired um, are, are really working hard to make sure that they do everything uh, that they can for your child. Our classified employees are, all, are, are in classrooms you know, uh, working with kids individually. We have some who are going to write at school who are helping kids to help, right? Our principals are working nonstop. Everybody's working hard. And I know, because I had Eli here with me, that it is just as hard on you at home. Uh, and especially for some of you who email me on Wednesday to remind me about the asynchronous Wednesday and how much harder it is, right? So all of us are tired and all of us are working hard. And I, and I know that. But part of this also is, is that we want to we do this in a safe manner, and we want to we adhere or, or give everybody the opportunity to do what, what they feel is right. And because of that, I, I, just, I ask for you to just be flexible with us just a little bit longer as we get through this part. Uh, but at the end of the day, our guarantee is this. We're going to do it in a safe and orderly fashion. We're going to make sure that your child's safety and our employee safeties will always be adhered to. And that's why we have a lot of PPE. That's why we have a lot of cleaning protocols in place. So, um, and I know that there are going to be questions on this. So I'm going to stop in a second um, and talk about two other, other topics real quick. And then we, we'll open up. I have two questions that came in and then I'll open it up to four. But I do want to point out, um, and, and I need to say this because this is actually one of the questions. Reopening looks different for middle schoolers than it does for elementary. And that is because of where we are on the state watch list. So right now, if we go into red, K through six can reopen. Um, middle school has to remain on the hybrid schedule. 
Um, and part of that's because of the count of the transmission rate. And yes, I know uh, I've been reading the reports about, you know, it came out of the University of Chicago about that kids, while they may not be uh, show the symptoms, um, have a higher viral load uh, than their older peers. And yes, we know that uh, young kids, if anybody's ever had, uh, or all of us on here, right, have had a kinder at some point, uh, we know that kids get sick at a higher rate and they bring that, that home to you. So we know that, right, that all of that information is out there. Um, but right now, the county is very clear about they want to limit the, num uh, the adults um, and really the teenagers, so kids over the age of 12 um, that have it. So that's, that's going to be a big impact. Um, so, but we're going to keep you posted. And as I get more information about the new state, you, uh, please keep in mind the new guidelines actually came out last week. So as we get more information about what the, what the, the county's intent is, I will, be, I will make sure that I pass it on. Uh, two other items real quick, and I'll, I'll move fast. Uh, so no more stories about Eli today. Uh, so strategic plan. Uh, so we uh, are embarking on a strategic plan. I just want to do just talk about this, uh, what the process is going to be. Uh, you will get a survey, and I apologize that more surveys are coming out. But also, uh, the principals will be coming back to ELAC. They will be coming back to uh, their site council. And they will also be coming back and getting feedback in the PTA meeting. There's a protocol that they're going to be given. That will occur in, um, in October. PTA presidents uh, will meet with me as well as a consultant. Uh, the DAC, um, DLAC, and there's one other group I'm forgetting. And the teacher and classified union will also have some feedback sessions. And then from there, uh, and, and principals will also be meeting with their staff and, and their teachers to gather feedback to. And we will be presenting that. Uh, we will have a big board retreat. There will be some people who will be participating in breakout rooms, but there will be a lot of feedback. It will be an open meeting for people to see. Uh, but I wanted to just talk about that part is coming. So if, um, if, you, if you are want to be a part of it and you want to be, uh, get verbal feedback, please make sure that you attend the October meetings, either site council, PTA, uh, um, DLAC or ELAC um, meetings so that you can be, a, you can share your voice. If not, there'll be a survey where you'll be able to, as well as a board meeting. Uh, the last one is that uh, there's been some changes. Uh, so there actually was a new law passed. It's a, it's a rider bill, the Senate Bill 98, uh, which has changed the way that attendance um, has to be processed. And we uh, have been pretty creative about cre uh, developing a system that uh, reduces the burden uh, on everyone to sort of keep track of the attendance. Um, and I want to turn it over to uh, Ms. Victor uh, to just talk about how that attendance process looks and, and some, some of the differences. Thank you. So um, obviously attendance looks very different in the world of distance learning than it did when kids were coming on campus. Um, when we were live in school last year, a kid could show up and they were totally a captive audience and we knew they were participating in all of their um, learning and, and activities. But now that we're in distance learning, the state has realized we need a different way to make sure that kids are engaged in all aspects of instruction. And so last week we got some new guidance about um, what we need to do to monitor attendance and participation. And so each, um, each day, each period for each portion of the day, we need to be monitoring and making sure that kids are, are not only just being there and being present, but participating in completing work um, on a regular basis. We also have to identify in our attendance whether our lessons are synchronous or asynchronous. And we need to identify whether kids are participating in whole or in part. And so all of this leads us to a very different system of taking attendance every day. And so teachers can't really take attendance first thing in the morning anymore to say, yes, your child participated fully and did all of their work today when the day hasn't yet begun. And so we're gonna be transitioning and taking attendance at the end of the day for elementary and at the end of the period for middle school so that teachers are able to say for each day in each period that yes, the student was here or participated or both, which is what we really hope is that they're there participating and turning in their work. And so you'll notice in when you, um, or teachers and, and schools will really notice, we'll have a distance learning code that 
explains how much your child participated. If there's a code of zero, that means that your child didn't attend or didn't participate or turn in any work. And if that's the case, then you'll get a call from the school and you'll have opportunities to explain why your child didn't come. Is it because of a technology issue and we need to get you some tech support? Or is it maybe because your child is sick? Um, and so we'll verify those reasons and get you the appropriate help so your child can really be actively participating. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we do our best to reach out to everybody. We understand from one period to the next how kids are doing so that we can really re-engage students and, um, and support every family and every child to make sure that they are getting all of the instruction possible. So um, as Dr. Rudolph said, the state put out some very interesting documents for teachers to mark off attendance and participation and work completion. And we thought, good gracious, um, teachers are exhausted and they're working so hard for your children. And I hope that your kids are enjoying all of the time they're spending. And so we have really tried to streamline the process to give one code in, in power school. So you'll notice that you won't see uh, participation codes in your Google Classroom anymore because those are gonna be tied into the actual attendance now. And so that's a little bit of a change, but it's a change to streamline everything so that your teachers can really focus on instructing their kids and that we understand fully how everybody is doing participation wise so that we can give them the very best support. All right, thank you, Tara. All right, uh, this is actually everybody's favorite part of the meeting. Um, so this is where we get some questions. Uh, so please make sure that you hit the raise. Oh, we already got one. Uh, make sure if you have a question that we do raise hands. Um, coffee's just now kicking in. So I'll try to keep my answers short, but if they go a little bit long, uh, Shelly just stop me at some point. Okay. All right, Mr. Glenn Bates. Good Hi. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I watched the board meeting last night, and there was an interesting comment you made in there um, when describing the options, option B and option C. And I, I went back and I watched an older board meeting and trying to get grapple with the, these two options, option B and C, and what I would do with my kids. And mm -hmm. I spent hours um, like wrestling with this, probably like the hour you spent talking about how safe it was at Eli's school and their mm -hmm. cleaning processes. It's been tearing me apart because neither option is great. Uh, mm -hmm. My kids are engaged right now. They're getting four days of live instruction. Uh, there's some tweaking that needs to be done a little bit here and there, right. but right. the move to distance learning as option C would not guarantee that they would stay with their school community. So mm -hmm. that could break them away from their friends, which is part of what's making the class so engaging this fall versus the spring. Mm -hmm. And uh, that disruption in uh, their engagement, I think would be detrimental to student outcome, which is one of the things I'm really worried about when I'm looking at these two options to pick from. Uh, the other option didn't look great to me because it only offered me two days of in-person live instruction with half of the students in their class for social interaction. And then three days of asynchronous, which reminds me of the spring again, which is what we were trying to get away from. And right. so then I'm really only opening up two days for me to go to work. Um, and then the other three days, I have to do a lot of work at home to like Wednesdays, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so, and my students are getting interaction from two teachers, one live, one that's a distance learning uh, asynchronous provided lesson. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about it from the teacher's perspective of trying to follow that and synchronize their lesson plan with that lesson plan. It's not easy for them to do. Um, I, I, I don't see, th there's a lot of negatives to going in and exposing yourself uh, for a couple of days and then bringing that home potentially. And if there's openings and closings and openings and closings and openings, then there's this context switching of, what are my students doing? They're back to distance learning this week. They're back to in class next week. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know because somebody had the flu and it wasn't COVID, but we didn't know that for a couple of days. So things had to be mm -hmm. shut down. The teacher had to be taken out of 
Commission. The one thing that you mentioned last night that was really interesting, and I had a negative reaction to it right away, and I thought about it more and more, it was very intriguing to me. And it was this idea of the distance learning lab tech or whatever, you, you had kind of like the old computer era thing of college where you would go and there was the computer person sitting there. Mm -hmm. That was really intriguing to me. And the more I thought about it, the more I started to really like that idea because uh, and I kind of want to pump it as an option D perhaps because mm -hmm. the idea of providing a space where parents can drop their kids off at a school, have mm -hmm. them monitored. Now they have a person in the room with them, but they're doing their interaction with their teacher on their screens. Mm -hmm. All right. That's five days of work that people, five days that people can go to work and make mm -hmm. sure that their kids are being at least safely monitored, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's also giving me the uh, flexibility to stay within my school community. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have to worry about losing my teacher. All the teachers stay the same. Um, we all stay at our, at our school communities. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were a lot of benefits that the other two options were lacking and making very distasteful to me for my own students' issues and their, their own cha our challenges with either of those options for, you know, I might have to do it separately. One kid in C, one kid in B, that's tricky. And then when we come back to a point when we can all go back to school, I might have one kid at Landles and then one kid at Monteloma. That's very, that's a struggle for me. On top of that, if I am taken, if both kids get bumped to a different school, I'm on site council, I can no longer serve there. I'm on PTA, I can no longer serve there. Mm -hmm. I have to switch schools. So you're disrupting some of the parent involvement that you would need kind of in the middle. It, it, this idea of having this learning lab person that we could hire, non-union, whatever, uh, was very, very intriguing to me because it solved so many problems. Yes, there would be a cost component. I can think of that. I can think there could be some behavior management issues you'd have to work through. But you still have teachers live with students on the screen in the same room virtually with that other, with that other person. There was just so much that, that struck me from that one little story you gave. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of almost a throwaway. It, was, it wasn't really discussed much, right? But, oh, my yeah. gosh, that, that opened up all kinds of possibilities and it improved the ability of people to work without having to monitor their students for those that choose to put their kids in that environment wow. it allows kids to have some sort of social interaction five days a week not two five days a week with their peers okay yep. that's more than the four that they get right now it also allows that Again, that school community component. You get to stay socially, emotionally. You know all your friends. You know all the people at your school. You don't know that if you're switching to another school site, all of a sudden, all of that becomes scary to you and kids will disengage. It also helps for my kids getting into dealing with SPED issues. I have one child that has speech and OT. If I switch schools, do I need to switch who's providing SPED services or would we maintain that? Yep. Um, okay. There's all kinds of things, so I'll let that go. I think I've said enough. Yeah. Uh, so, so let me let me talk about a couple of things real quick, and I'm going to try to be quick on this one. Right. Uh, the first one, the sort of lab type example, we sort of talked about that earlier in the meeting. Um, so the count, the state has came up with uh, you. The board can identify certain groups of students who can come in uh, in cohorts of 14 to one or 14 to two. And so, and this, this actually goes around the waiver process, right? And what they call it is sort of a support system. Um, it's not live instruction, it's the support. So uh, my reference was, it was almost like the computer lab, right? So back in the nineties, you go into a computer lab, there's a person there, they're only there for support, they're not helping you with other stuff. We are actually starting to uh, explore this. The first group of kids uh, will be our homeless students. Um, and then we will continue to build from there, right? And there's a capacity issue, which is about the number of kids that we that we can get in because it's 14 to one. And it also is about the number of hourly employees that we can bring back or the number of people we can hire. And yes, you are right. That provides you with the opportunity to bring your kids in and then you get the opportunity to go to work. So that's one process. And as we, I think the first, it starts on the 14th and 
we'll be able to report back what we're seeing. And then from there, I think the next group right after them is actually special ed and that we're looking at. And then we'll keep working through the system until we figure out as many kids as possible. So that is actually taking place. And you're right, that does allow you to stay with your, your teacher uh, in, this, in this process. And at the same time, you're still in the distance learning format because the teacher is still teaching. Uh, the challenge is gonna be the more kids we bring back in, the less space we have for teachers who are working in their classrooms. And so we, we sort of have to work with that. Now, the second part I wanna point out is about the hybrid model. And this is why I've sort of been coy about this. And I think Trustee Wilson sort of called me out on it a little bit, um, which is the exact thing that you're saying. I have four days of live instruction, right? Whether my kids like it or not, I still got four days of live instruction. I got one day of, in, of asynchronous instruction. Why, why would I, and this has been her, her issue to me, why would I give up four days to go to two, right? And that's a, that's a real valid concern. So what we, uh, and I sort of said this on the fly and Trustee Conley was like, well, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Because it's not, we really haven't thought about it yet. One of, the, one of the things that we're going to do as we get more information from parents about whether you're, you're, you're interested is we're gonna look at what's the viability of us being able to offer more than just two days uh, for the hybrid. But we won't be able to know that until we see the numbers. And that's why we sort of had that math example of, well, if uh, X amount of kids sign up for distance learning, then we can assign them across the district. And then the other kids could come in at a 15 to one ratio and they could attend more days. We won't know that until we actually see the numbers. And we're gonna try to build it out. I mean, we can do a sort of a math and a, you know, a, a equation just to see what it all looks like. But that's also part of what we're going to do, right? It's also, we're going to look to see, can we increase the number of days that we offer? Or is it just that the two days on, the two days uh, in, the, in the three days off is the best that we can do? Um, so that is a part of the exercise that we're going to go through. Um, and I know, you, you know, just listening to you, that probably makes a difference into, in terms of what you would decide. Um, knowing whether it's four days or five days. Um, and I know there's other aspects of it too, like do I get to keep the teacher and everything else? But it does have an impact for people, right? If I can get four days of in-person instruction or if I can get five days of in-person instruction, would I choose that versus getting two days? And so right now, we don't have an answer for that. And I, you know, again, I, I just wanna stress like we're all, we're trying to be flexible for our planning so that we can accommodate the, the, the feedback that we're getting, which is exactly this, right? I want my kid to stay with the teacher, but I also want to make sure they get the maximum number of days. And because I'm, I want all that to happen, uh, are there any ways that you can make adjustments to the hybrid? So over, not this weekend, I'm actually going, I think we should all take a break uh, this weekend. Uh, but over the next couple of weeks, we're going to work, we're going to try our best to work through that and communicate that out so that you understand what it looks like. Um, and then hopefully that gives you more, uh, uh, can help you to make an informed decision across the board. So just know that, that those two things are coming, but the lab, the, the sort of lab tech approach is being implemented as we go. Okay, okay. we have Lori yep. Brody. Okay, I think I hit the unmute button. I have a question about why Mountain View is gonna take 12 weeks from let's say Tuesday is the reopening date, which is the 8th, which means 20, the 22nd is the 14 days after that, which you originally had promised over the summer for reopening. It's gonna take 12 weeks where Palo Alto and Los Altos are both coming in earlier, and Los Altos has already filed a waiver to stay open if we do go back to purple. Why isn't Mountain View taking the same movements forward versus saying we're gonna keep the kids home for three months? I didn't, I didn't say, if you heard the presentation yesterday, I didn't say that it's going to take us 12 weeks. I said the ideal time frame that it would take us to plan for this would be 12 weeks. I mean, yeah, technically we can do anything over the next week and a half. I mean, we could, you know, could the principals, and I, and I think I brought this up in the board meeting, could the principals take two weeks to schedule all the kids? They could. Uh, could we cut the, the survey down to a week? We could. Is that the right thing to do, considering everything else that people have on their plate? That's the part that I don't know. And at what point does it become an impediment? 
I think, you know, Can, when, I'm when, sorry. Look, hold on, hold on, hold on, Lori. When this presentation was created, the state didn't even change their watch list. So we were assuming, we thought, okay, so when is the most likely time that we can get through the transmission process and safely bring kids in and we chose when's the next five day five day break the next five day break actually is around thanksgiving and so if you backwards map how long it would take to ideally plan in a perfect world scenario to get it done without stressing out everybody uh it is it is a 12-week process now all that is dependent upon a lot of other factors now I want to be clear about this. Those altos, even though they apply for the waiver, their board president has said, provided that the teachers are willing to come in. Palo Alto is, yes, Palo Alto is saying, but Palo Alto is also using an approach that will probably lead to some unrest over there. And if that's the way that Palo Alto wants to go, great. We have already started working with our teachers to talk about what is it going to take to bring us back? And what are the concerns that we have? And I think that's the most important part because I think if we want to get the best for every single kid, we need our teachers and our staff to feel comfortable coming back in. So ideally, it will take us 12 weeks. Could it be faster? Of course it could be faster. But 12 weeks right now, it's just with everything else on the plate, right? I mean, if you just think about what Glenn and I just talked about, we could change the process over the next couple of weeks and inform you and then give you two weeks to actually do the survey. And then we could schedule kids and then give you another, another chance to make a choice, right? That is what the 12 weeks is about. It's about, making, it's about being deliberate in the process. If we just say hybrid is the way that we're gonna go and we're not giving you any other type of option, we can speed this up a lot faster. So the, the point of the 12 weeks was to talk about what is the ideal approach to make this happen that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's going to occur obviously if the state says that we can reopen then we'll try to figure out what's the fastest way that we can reopen but do it in a safe and orderly fashion and there are some constraints that have to occur i want every I, not that I, that every employee has to feel comfortable but i need to make sure that you know I'm, I, you know kathy's on here and I'm, she's right under my at least on my box i need to make sure that kathy feels comfortable that she's coming back in Right. I, I want her to know that we are doing everything that we can to protect her, but I also want her to be able to convey that to her kids too, that every kid is going to be safe. And that's why we put the 12 weeks in. And it's just, it just happens to be the process that we thought was feasible not to kill people. And not, not like I say that in, in terms of wear them down entirely, not like Understood. main. Understood. Okay. Understood. Yeah, understood. It's just that if our kids are out two months longer than neighboring districts, our kids are then at a disadvantage behind them because in-person, in-classroom is important. I can tell you, and I'm sure if you speak with CSEA, uh, which is the, the classified union, or if you teach, talk with MBA, the teachers, I, I can assure you that I don't think that Palo Alto and Los Altos are gonna beat us to the punch um at all i and i and i think this is the sentiment across the state um but we are actually in a very good position right now that our teams at least this is what they they've said that they feel comfortable with all the safety provisions that we put in and the fact that we are prioritizing that and that we're really taking that seriously and i think that's actually what's going to get us there faster um than you know firing a shot across out and really making this us versus them con uh thing and don't get me wrong like there are times when I don't mind firing a shot across the bow, but I don't think this is one of those instances. I think one of the instances is to get us to, to open as quickly as possible, we got to all do it together as a community. Um, and so that's what we're looking for. And I, you know, I talk with Jeff, I talk with Don, uh, they keep it, we all sort of share each other's ideas. We'll see what's going to happen in the coming weeks. Okay. okay. Hello, Trish Gilbert. Hi, okay. Um, Dr. Rudolph, you mentioned something about middle school being different than K through six, but for us, sixth grade includes middle school. So I wasn't sure when you say middle school, are you meaning seventh, eighth, or are you actually meaning sixth, seventh, eighth? 
Seventh eighth. So right now they got the guidelines are different uh, for six K through six than they are for seven eight. And so seven, uh, sixth grade would actually be allowed to attend using a different format. No. Okay, we have Catherine Chan. Hi, um, I just have a quick comment. I uh, wanted to say that I appreciate the way you, Dr. Rudolph, framed your assessment of distance learning in your opening, which is a, a little different from what I've heard uh, before. I appreciate that you acknowledge the amount, that the amount of in-person instruction that we're having today is not working for all kids. Um, and it was helpful for me to, to hear that it's, it's better for more kids than what we were doing in spring. If you look at other factors like availability of devices and internet and in, in past meetings and communications, I felt that those of us for whom several hours of daily Zoom isn't working for our child have, have maybe been unseen. Um, mm -hmm. Those of us for whom asynchronous Wednesdays are like the best day of the week for our kid. Because um, mm -hmm. the reality is that my first grader needs the same amount of support from me, who's the only adult in the house and who's supposed to be teleworking full time. Um, on asynchronous days and synchronous days. So um, that feeling of, of being unseen has made the daily struggle with her that much harder. So I appreciate your acknowledgement. It matters and I'll continue to work with our truly wonderful teacher in hopes of maybe reducing the number of Zoom hours required every day so we can keep the school joy alive. Yep, and, and, and I'll just say just real quick, thanks, thanks for that. I know it's, I know it's hard. Um, I, I would just simply say, I think teachers are trying their best to keep kids engaged as long as possible because they understand that kids are at home. And as a result of that, um, you know, they're on the screen time for a lot. And I think, I think it's because you're used to, you're trying to, teachers are trying to provide the social interaction that normally would occur on a day-to-day -day basis when kids are in. And so because of that, we are overcompensating or they're trying to, to appease parents as much as, as we can. And sometimes it's just allowing ourselves the opportunity to simply say, you know what, take a moment, come back on uh, in an hour or in a half hour, take a break and, and, and do that or do this activity at home. And I think that we still have a lot of work to do around that in, in that regard um, for everybody, even the kids that are where it's going really good we still have some work to do with just allowing ourselves to say it's okay for us to do something a little bit different. And that's going to take time and it's, it's all new to us, uh, but it is something that, that we we're working on. And I do hear the parents who are who love the asynchronous days, but are struggling with the, with the distance days. I know it's hard on both ends. This, this is not the ideal setting. Um, it's, you know, we're trying to make the most out of what we can. Uh, but I do think, you know, in this regard, what I can say is I at least feel confident that, that kids are getting daily live instruction, uh, you know, in every single subject, which wasn't happening in the spring. And that's no fault of anybody's, right? It was, we were tossed with a situation. We tried our best to do it. Um, and I think our teachers are doing an amazing job of making it work. Our IAs are, are doing, doing amazing work also. But we'll keep trying to get better and we'll keep using the feedback uh, to try and, and improve so that we can meet the needs of more kids across the board. And please continue to work with your teacher um, to get that done. Hi, Kristen Bailey. Unmute. I may have missed the asynchronous uh, schedule description earlier in this meeting, but I just read in one of the emails from the principal that the way the check-in is working for middle school will be changing. Uh, does that mean that the Zoom calls will be longer or can you please describe that a little bit better for me? Because we, as well as a family, like that lack of Zoom on that day is really healthy for us. Uh, Tara, you want to jump in? It's, it's really it's just moving to the end of the day, but uh, Tara, you want to chime in here? Well, I mean, we do have a, a morning check-in in middle school, and we have a end-of-day check-out. But uh, the email that I read just earlier today looks like it said that they have to check in and out out of each class so each period throughout the day which seems tedious so can you help describe that a little bit more sure on wednesdays the asynchronous um attendance will be taken it does not require a zoom check-in what that means is teachers will be checking to make sure that the kids completed their work 
for that period of the day. And then the teacher will go in and give an asynchronous attendance and participation code. It does not mean that your children have to do a Zoom meeting for every period on Wednesday. Okay. Does that help? It helps, yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we have Mr. Mike Lerner. Hi there, thanks. Um, I saw the email about lunches and uh, we were thinking that heading over to school to pick up a lunch might be a fun activity for the kids, uh, but we don't want to do it if that causes, you know, budget consequences for the district or anything. So uh, what's happening with the, the lunches and should, you know, all families, FRL and non-FRL, uh, head over to the school to pick up lunches if they want it or would that be causing some financial issues? And, and what? Rebecca, what, what are you doing over there? What, 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 what is that? I needed to be unmuted. <laughs> oh, well, you just unmute yourself. Is it like... I can't. <laughs> oh, okay. Do you want to answer this? Is that why you're, you're jumping up and down? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I hope I don't contradict you with my answer, but go ahead. Why don't you go first, just in case? <laughs> Is any any family, any kid under the age of 18 uh, can get a free meal um, regardless of free and reduced lunch status. Um, and so, and we're looking uh, at increasing the hours that you can pick it up um, as well as uh, providing more meals um, at one time so that you don't have to come out at, as much. And so by all means, feel free uh, to come pick up a meal uh, get yourself out of the out of the area or out not out of the area but get yourself out of the house and and pick them up and stuff and i know uh the noon supervisors and the cafeteria uh, members would love to see the kids um and sort of have that social interaction too is that what you're going to say rebecca i i'll add to it um <laughs> <laughs> um thank you so much for being conscious about wanting to not uh, cause a district to incur extra costs, it's actually super helpful if you go out and pick up food. Because for every meal that's picked up, we receive a reimbursement from the state and the federal government for the meals handed out. And the district is committed not to laying anyone off. So all of our employees are currently working and that's actually additional revenue for the school district. So please participate. <laughs> And, and, and I would just simply say, just the last thing, we have been committed across the board to making sure that we provide meals. Uh, we've been, we, you know, it's why we have the food truck, it's why we've been doing summer feeding the way that we have. Uh, this summer, we gave out 3,500 meals a day. Uh, we provided meals to the high school district as well as to Los Altos school district. Please, I, come get a meal. It, it does not matter what your status is under the age of 18. And sometimes uh, for those adults who act, who need a meal too, uh, they, can, they can pick one up for themselves too. We, we, we want the meals to go. So uh, not saying that if you're over 18 that you're supposed to get one, but if you happen to have two people in the household and you need something, uh, we don't want anybody going home. All right. Okay. It looks like Rachel is going to... Uh oh, you're muted and then you muted yourself. Yeah, it's. Hi. Um, I'm sorry to go back to a totally different topic now that we're all like at the end of the day and talking about food and stuff. Um, but um, our school and our teacher have been amazing so far. Um, it's clear that a lot of planning went in over the summer that we didn't have the chance to have in the spring, which we totally understand. Um, I just wanted to ask a little more about the BC choices that we're going to be asked to make. And if parents, you know, we talked about, um, Glenn talked about some different stuff of, you know, considerations, different families, of course, have different considerations as to what they mm -hmm. might choose. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if we'll have information either now or when we're being asked to make a choice about what will happen if, you know, we pick B or C, which may involve shuffling 
um, away from our current teacher. For some people, it sounds like potentially away from their current schools. What will happen if things get worse again? And will the district have a plan in place for that? If all of a sudden everybody gets booted back to how we are now, we'll be in these new classes that the kids may have only been with in person for a short amount of time with a new second teacher. Will we remain in those groups for you know, the foreseeable future? Or you know, will we have that information um, when we're making these choices? Yep. Um, so what I would tell you is that this will be the last change that uh, we would make, right? And so we debated um, right before the start of the school year um, whether or not we were going to try and implement a switch uh, with, you know, two weeks. I think it was two weeks uh, we met with the board on maybe the 2nd of August, right? And, um, you know, it was this large conversation about at the board meeting, um, do we implement, do we implement uh, this right now and survey parents or do we simply move forward? And we actually felt like moving forward because we were uncertain about what this would look like down the road and allow people to sort of um, get into the routine was more important than the final switch um, right before the school year. Um, especially because by that time, it was right before or like a couple of days before the class list were posted. And so in that regard, we felt like, you know, and actually some people actually found out their class list because once they went into power school, they knew exactly who their teacher was. And so we, we were just very concerned that another change would impact us, but this would be the last time that we would do this. And this would remain for the rest of the year, um, unless you choose to move from B to C. Right. If you choose to go from C to B, then your child's teacher is going to change. But if you stay in that path for the rest of the year, uh, you're going to be with that teacher um, in, until the until the end of the year. And then obviously next year we'll know more. Hopefully we'll, we'll be out of this stage. We'll be back to either stage two or stage one uh, and we'll be able to to keep kids in that in that process. And so that's that's sort of the thinking process that went behind it. It wasn't perfect, um, but we felt like, you know, the, the benefit of not creating one more stressor to parents uh, and families outweighed the need to, to quickly try to re reshuffle all of our kids uh, beforehand. And there's pluses and minuses on each one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Rudolph, it's 4.32. You wanna keep yep. going or? I can do I can do the last question from Glenn, and I actually do have a four thirty meeting, so uh, I'm going to send a note to them that I'm going to be a couple minutes late. But Glenn, if we can make this one quick, I'll we'll we, we'll finish with you. I will try my best. Um, I appreciate everything you're saying. I appreciate hearing from the other people. I want to plug again my that idea of having that lab person because you could add in very easily a layer of for people who want asynchronous only. So it would be very simple to layer asynchronous only on top of distance on site and distance at home because some people will still choose to keep their kids at home instead of send them in, in, in for that. I would also encourage that when you are uh, providing people with information for the survey that you be very clear about what your expectations are for different activities on site. So, um, for example, you're taking down basketball hoops. You complained last night about the amount of activity at Crittenden, and yet there's going to be some sort of activity for kids on site. If parents are expecting in-person interaction, uh, we need to know what does that look like if I'm going to choose that because I'm, I'm really trying to balance social interaction along with student outcome. Student outcome mm -hmm. is a key component for me. I know the pressure from the outside world is get people so they can go to work, but we need to focus also on student outcome. And B just looks like a big hybrid mess of um, logistics that mm -hmm. would impede student outcome. It would complicate teachers' lives and how they work their schedule. And, and so I want to be very clear when I'm making a selection that I'm being held to for the rest of the year as far as being able to go back to my home school because uh, it's it's kind of making me feel like I'm in a lottery to be in my neighborhood school and it, that's uncomfortable to me. So um, 
please be very clear about what the expectations are for what in-school interaction looks like so that people can go, you know, that's not enough for me. That's not, a, you know, the two days is not enough of a payoff for the three days of asynchronous or at which, you know, what I kept hearing before was we wanted to move away from that. That was the feedback from the spring. Asynchronous was bad. Some people really love it. So again, I love that layer of being able to put an asynchronous option on for people. Yep. But please just consider that. I'll let you go. So, so what I would say is each, and I would encourage each of y'all to reach out to your, your principals. Um, they actually have plans for what the interactions look like, how the court, how the school yards are divided out, who's going to go in what area. Um, so they've actually worked through all that. They did it in the spring. We haven't really talked about it because we, we're, we're not at that state, but I think that's a, a good thing. And I'll take it back to the leadership team to make sure that people uh, sort of, we start discussing that uh, from that standpoint. But it is uh, a part of, of the approach. Um, so with that, uh, I will say, simply say, thanks all for the feedback. Um, these are great points. Please, you know, so uh, Labor Day was really installed for uh, those who are day laborers to take a break uh, from the work. Um, I know now it's synonymous with sales and appliances and everything else. But really, I think all of us are at a place, uh, whether you're working in tech, whether you're not working, whether you're in the school system, all of us are just mentally tired. I, I, I've, I've never had coffee uh, at 3.20 in the afternoon in order to keep going for my final meetings. But I did it today because I'm just that physically tired and I'm not the only one. I know everybody on here is also physically tired. So please make sure that you take a moment for yourself uh, thank you for all of your support. I know it has not been perfect, but I do appreciate your support. I know our teachers do. And the last thing I will say is this. Uh, we hear, all of us are hearing a lot about how bad things are, how things are going to be better. I would encourage each of us, including myself, to simply reach out uh, to our staff members, to the teachers who are working really hard, and just say thank you for the work you're doing. I know it seems like something small, but you'd be surprised how far that will go. Um, and they need to hear from you more than they need to hear from me because you, you are the people who are who are they're really interacting with. And yes, hearing the message from me really resonates, but I, I, I tell you what, I still have messages from 1999 from parents who said, thank you for teaching my kid. And I pull them out on those tough days to remind me why I'm still in the work. So an email, a phone call, something, a voice memo would really go a long way um, to, to really help them. And I, and I say that because they need, some, they need some pep in this step as we had in the Labor Day. And I know you all need it too, um, but they really do. They've been working really hard. So thank you all for everything that you've done so far. Thank you for tuning in yet again. Please have a safe, holiday, wear your mask so that we can get out of this, um, social distance away from everybody else except for your family. And again, take Monday off, un unplug, unwind, uh, and, and do something that charges your soul. Thanks, everybody.